Now, I want to show you something. We always talk about randomness. The universe came, out, came, out, came about by randomness. That's the whole premise of evolution, right? How many have ever seen randomness? Besides at Las Vegas, okay. As you look at randomness, and the intent here was to assemble random bits. And by the way, that turns out to be very difficult to do. In a computer, you can't get randomness. They have pseudo-random number generators that generate a string of numbers that may meet as many tests as they can conceive of for randomness, but they're still not really random. And, but I want, you, I want you to look at these, ran, the, treat these as random numbers. Do you, know what's, do you notice what's missing? There's something missing here. Can you spot what's missing? Randomness lacks symmetry. Do you ever see random things symmetrical? See, the very concept of symmetry implies order. A center line on a drawing implies that there's an architect around. That's how they discovered all kinds of things about the architecture of the Temple Mount, because these things all line up on a center line. That has profound implications. You notice randomness lacks periodicity. Every third one doing something or whatever. Any, there's no periodicity. In fact, that's one of the tests of randomness. If there's any periodicity, it, it fails the test of randomness. You know what I mean by periodicity? It, it has a cycle. Okay. Randomness lacks any evidence of design by definition. Because if there's design, that implies it's no longer random. And, uh, and uh, it, randomness lacks order of any kind. That's why the scientists, as they search for extraterrestrial life, listen to the noise, the randomness, in the hopes of finding some kind of order. And what they ruin out, of course, if it's periodic, every second or something, it could be generated by some natural phenomenon. So periodicity does it. You know, they're not looking for that. And, uh, but they're looking for any evidence of design. That's why random numbers are a typical conjecture. If you're trying to communicate to another alien culture, a series of random numbers is one of the ways to get their attention, presumably, because how would you generate that? Well, I got a surprise for you because there's some other, there's a, there is a sequence of numbers that, how many have ever heard of the Fibonacci numbers? There's how many? There's one, two, three, anybody else? Okay, it's interesting. I have heard about these since I was a kid. I never took them seriously. And, the, uh, and because they are the domain of some pretty strange characters. But um, back in the 12th century, Leonardo Fibonacci, he was messing around trying to predict rabbit populations. And he discovered a series of numbers that bears his name. And the first, it's one, one, then two. Each number is the sum of the previous two. Third number is two. The next number is three, which is one plus two. Then three is two plus, you know, two plus three is five. Five plus three is eight. Five and eight are 13. Eight and 13 are 21. See, each number is the sum of the previous two. You follow me? That is the Fibonacci sequence. He first, the mathematician, he first discovered it in the 12th century, but he didn't recognize the real significance. It took several hundred years for people to discover that this sequence appears in nature in some of the strangest places. The ratio of any two adjacent numbers is approximately 1.6. It varies a little bit in the second and third decimal place, but it's very close to that. And uh, now, it was several, as I say, several hundred years before the significance of the sequence is recognized. There is a sequence, it shows up in what's sometimes called the golden rectangle. The ancient Greeks seem to discover that there's a rectangle whose proportions are the most pleasing. And uh, they call that the golden rectangle. That's when the, the longer side is the shorter side, as the shorter size is the sum of the two sides. And that's a rectangle of a certain proportion. It's on the screen right now. That rectangle is called by artists and, and scientists and mathematicians as the golden rectangle. And it has some peculiar characteristics. The ratio of the short side to the long side, the long side is 1.618 of the short side. But the point is, if you take a square out of that, you still end up with a golden rectangle. If you take a square out of that, you end up with a golden rectangle, and, and, go, and so forth. You follow me? It's got some interesting mathematical properties, and on it goes. OK. It turns out the Parthenon in Greece, the Great Pyramid, the United Nations building, your credit cards, your playing cards, postcards, the switch on your light switch at home, writing pads, three by five cards, five by eight cards, all of these <laughs> are based on the golden rectangle, whether you realize it or not, okay? In, in art, Leonard da Vinci, Van Gogh, Vermeer, John Singer Sargent, Monet, Whistler, Renoir, 
uh, many artists recognized that by building their art on that golden rectangle, it gave it vitality and moment, movement. And uh, it was a, the dynamic, what they call dynamic symmetry, in contrast to static symmetry. So it implies growth, power, movement, and gives animation and so forth. And the artists have discovered that, and if you're a student of art, you're well acquainted with this. In floral arrangements, we discover the lily has three petals, the yellow-violet, five, delphinium, eight, the mayweed, 13, the aster, 21, berithium has 34, helium, helium has 55, Michaelmas daisy has 89. So if you're one of these people, she loves me, she loves me not, if you know the Fibonacci numbers, you've got a chance of winning that one. Okay. <laughs> All these, of course, are the, in, the, in the Fibonacci se sequence. There's a study among scientists called phyllotaxis, and that's where you study the arrangement of leaves around the stem of a plant. Visualize taking a plant and taking a cross-section and seeing how the leaves are ordered in the plant. It turns out the elm always has one half the circumference, the beech or the hazel has one third, the apricot and the oak have uh, two every five, the pear, the poplar has three eighths, each one of these, the almond, the pussy willow, pine trees, are always 5 to 21 or th to, uh, 13 to 34. These are all Fibonacci numbers. Now, first of all, they discovered this, and that was bizarre because you'll never find a number that's not in the Fibonacci se sequence, which is weird. Out of 434 angiosperm and 44 gymnosperms, they all have Fibonacci numbers in their design. And scientists have discovered that that maximizes the exposure to sunlight and air without shading or crowding from the other leaves. Depends on the nature of the leaves. So this is a result of very skillful design. But the design is motivated in part by beauty. And there's a whole other thing. I didn't get a chance to do this. You go down. If you're, if you're a diver, you know if you go down 60, 90 feet or so, it starts getting bluer and bluer, pretty dark. You go down deep enough where it's dark and turn on a light, things are incredibly colorful. Why? Nobody can see them. Why are they created in the first place? For his pleasure. We have a God that loves beauty. A whole other thing I get into here, as you drive and see scenery, you never see it monotonous. Except unless you're going through Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, as, you, yeah, I was as I was driving in here, thinking about this talk, you know, as you go drive a mountain road, we dr dr drive through a mountain road and there's all these trees. The trees are random, and yet they're not monotonous. The design of the trees are not predictable. Each one's different, and yet conforms to a motif. It's astonishing how you can look through nature and never see monotony. It's always got the strange variety. So about seeds. The rows of bracts on pine cones, it's 8 or 13. There's two rows. On pineapples, there's three rows. It's 8, 13, and 21. And uh, it turns out there's an optimum divergence angle of 137.5, which is a in effect, a fraction of the 360, that's a Fibonacci, a Fibonacci number, it produces the best packing. And that's why you always see Fibonacci, Fibonacci spirals on sunflower. If you look at sunflower, you've got two divergent spirals. They're both Fibonacci numbers. And uh, let's talk about music. How many people play music in here? OK, you've got five keys that are the pentatonic, pentatonic scale, right? You've got eight that are called the diatonic scale. Those are, those are Fibonacci numbers. You put them both together, you've got a chromatic scale, eight and five, together. A major sixth, which is considered, for strange reasons, beautiful, is a ratio of frequencies. That's three to five. Uh, and a minor sixth is, a, again, a ratio of, these are all Fibonacci numbers, all through music. For some reason, it's, it works. Certain chord, you hit two keys, some of them work, some don't. If you're a musician, you know why. But part of the reason is you've got Fibonacci numbers undergirding that whole analysis. But here's the one that blew me away. I was reading up on this, and I thought, that's kind of weird. If you look at the revolution of the planets in our solar system, you've got Neptune. Pluto is a problem for a number of people. I won't get into that here. But you've got Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, the, uh, the asteroid belt, Mars, Earth, and Venus, and Mercury. If you adjust the observed orbits just slightly to what I'll call here the theoretical orbits, each one is a Fibonacci ratio to the previous one. And, you say, and uh, Pluto is too, but in an inverse way, because it's 90,000 miles against Neptune's 60,000, so that's a three to two thing. But I want to stay out of that for some other reasons. Uh, Neptune, uh, Pluto's a whole other issue. 
Anyway, the point is, what's interesting, these are the same ratios that you find in the elm, the beech, the apricot, the pear, the almond, the elm, the pine, uh, three different uh, pine uh, numbers. You say, what on earth does the trees have to do with the design of the solar system? Very simple. The same guy did both of them. <laughs> the same guy had an had a insight of what makes things beautiful. That beauty is an elusive concept on the one hand, and yet we discover there are certain rules even in design that we find. Let's just take one more. If we take the, gold, the golden rectangle, take a square out of it, take another square out of it, take another square out of it, we have, with the golden rectangle, we can create a spiral, right? Very famous spiral, it turns out. It's the only spiral that does not alter its shape as it grows. It has that math, peculiar mathematical property. And you've all seen one. It was called the chambered nautilus shell. It shows up a lot of other places too, but I mentioned this is just a, a very crisp example. You find that in, in the hurricane, spiral seeds, the ram's horn, the hit tail of a seahorse, fern leaves, the DNA molecule. You'll find it in waves breaking on a beach, tornadoes, galaxies, the tail of a comet around the sun, whirlpools, seed patterns of sunflowers, daisies, and dandelions, the ears of all mammals, and especially the cochlea of the human ear. You have one in your ear that helps convert the sound vibrations into pulses that the ear can transmit to the brain. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. You remember Da Vinci's famous anatomical sketch of, uh, of man. And you take from the navel to his feet and you discover it's a golden rectangle. Related. If you know that distance, you know how tall he is by applying the golden rectangle. And uh, you can do that. From, uh, from his navel to his chin, you'll find the length of his face. From his chin to his lips, the no tip to the nose to the pupils, uh, the pupils to the top of his head, and so forth. All these yield the distances of various parts. You'll discover the golden relationships are all through his basic design. And since man is in the image of God, in some sense, it's not surprising to find out he apparently has what we understand to be mathematically harmonious proportions. And we find that all through nature, even whether you're talking about seeds in a plant or the orbits of the planets then. Because if there's design, that implies it's no longer random. And, uh, and uh, it, randomness lacks order of any kind. That's why the scientists, as they search for extraterrestrial life, listen to the noise, the randomness, in the hopes of finding some kind of order. And what they ruin out, of course, if it's periodic. Do you, know what's, do you notice what's missing? There's something missing here. Can you spot what's missing? Randomness lacks symmetry. Do you ever see random things symmetrical? See, the very concept of symmetry implies order. A center line on a drawing implies that there's an architect around. That's how they discovered all. Now, I want to show you something. We always talk about randomness. The universe came out. Came out came about by randomness. That's the whole premise of evolution, right? How many have ever seen randomness? Besides at Las Vegas, okay. As you look at randomness, all kinds of things about the architecture of the Temple Mount, because these things all line up on a center line. That has profound implications. You notice randomness lacks periodicity. Every third one doing something or whatever. Any, there's no periodicity. In fact, that's one of the tests of randomness. If there's any periodicity, it, it fails the test of randomness. You know what I mean by periodicity? It has a cycle, okay. Randomness lacks any evidence of design by definition. And the intent here was to assemble random bits. And by the way, that turns out to be very difficult to do. In a computer, you can't get randomness. They have pseudo-random number generators that generate a string of numbers that meet as many tests as they can conceive of for randomness. But they're still not really random. And But I want you... I want you to look at these, ran, treat these as random numbers. 